So this is the Vanguard Circle of the Jewish Socialist Bund, and this is uh, Dr. Ibrahim Weisfeld, PhD in political science from the University of Quebec and Montreal, continuing the reading and commentary on the work by Les Fisher, which is so the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state during the period of the Second International, when the big debates on the so-called Jewish question were happening. But first, we have Shabbos, and now we're going to light the Shabbos candles. Here we go. Baruch atah denai, l'hinu melech olam, l'hadnik sheh. Shabbos. Here we go. There, all three of them. Oh, this one is. Let's see what's happening here. These candles don't want to say that. I'm going to have to make a modification here, so pause. Be right back. Okay, let's try again. I think it does it. Yes, Shabbos is saved once again. Okay. Now, we continue with the reading of uh, the important work describing the inadequacies of the um, initial Marxist uh, analysis of national minorities and the Jewish national minority in particular. Okay. Let's go to share here. And I've got it there. Right now, we're on page 126. Okay. And here we go. Finally, uh -huh. the intervention of the Fraction, which is the Social Democratic Faction in the uh, Reichstag, in the Parliament, the German Parliament. Okay, finally, let's take another look at the interventions by the Fraction. As already mentioned, the Fraction discussed Lucius's situation twice once towards the end of 1899, and again a year later. There are very few sources available to us on this matter. The Faction began to keep regular minutes only in December 1898, and until 1914, these minutes usually documented only the decisions reached without offering any insight into the preceding debates. You know, they should be called, you know, doing a procès verbal like in France. Hmm. As for the first occasion on which the Faction dealt with Luce, the minutes for the 23rd of November 1899 merely relate that the Faction had, following a suggestion by Comrade Meissner, Meister, accepted Babel's proposal to inform the editors of Naya Zeit of the wish of the Faction that it no longer accept contributions from the author Luce. Fortunately for us, Babel wrote, to Kautsky the following day to inform him of the decision and explain the matter. It really is basically the modern chronology is a lot of clever than Jane Noble and Thusanne and social branch it is generally. But he's certainly an example. When I said that the book will hold a special place in the history of the criminal justice and prison system. Okay, that's footnote. Forget it. Fortunately for us, people wrote to Kautsky the following day to inform him of the decision and explain the matter. The fact that Luce was collaborating with Naya Zeit, although his reputation was not only badly compromised, but he also used to act with indescribable contempt towards the party, had led to debate in the faction. Meister brought the matter up at the behest of the comrades in Hanover, who became aware of it due to the fact that Hanover Schera Corrier remarked on the matter. They are particularly outraged because Luce used to be in the Hanover and they knew him. Babel's exact formulation is worth looking at with some care. Its nuances are more obvious in the original German version. Babel wrote 
that Lucius's critics had based the case on the fact that, quote, nicht nur schwer kompromittere wird, sondern in freier sich gegen die Partei bedonnes gemein benonnen habe. This could mean simply that Luce was both compromised and had behaved appallingly towards the party. Okay, what does it really mean? Okay, difficult to translate. It is equally possible, though, that the formulation was, in fact, alluding to two issues. Luce had been compromised at a certain point, but his contemptible behavior towards the party predated that point. It preceded whatever it was that had subsequently compromised him. In that case, we could safely assume that Luce displayed the contemptible behavior in question during his career as an anti-Semitic activist. Whatever he had been compromised by, on the other hand, would then have transpired later, i.e., when he was no longer an anti-Semitic activist. This could mean that Luce was considered compromised by his conviction for perjury. Alternatively, he could have been cons considered compromised by something even more recent, most likely the fact that he was so promiscuous when it came to getting his stuff published. That this is the most plausible explanation is borne out by another piece of circumstantial evidence. A few days later, on the 20th of November, Babel informed Kautsky that Richter had just given me the attached newspaper item, Nodung, that confirms that was that what was suggested but could not be proven in the fax in the faxium. This report will make it easier for you to speak out against Luce. Needless to say, you can also inform Mehring of the report. It will cover his back too. The item in question appears to have been lost. We no longer know what it was, but what might it possibly have proven? Surely not that Luce had said nasty things about Jews or behaved in a beastly fashion towards social democracy while he was an anti-Semitic activist. This, after all, was quite uncontroversial, as it was, in fact, that he had been imprisoned for perjury. We can also rule out that the item in question was, was the four-line report from the Hanoverscher Courrier that had first brought the matter to the attention of the comrades in Hanover because Babel had already sent a text from the Hanoverscher Courrier to Mehring on the evening of the 23rd, 23rd November. Hence, the faction surely must have considered Luce compromised by something else. Unless the faction's concern had been aroused by something altogether different that has left no trace of all in the sources, what it might possibly have sprung from, other than Luce's rather indiscriminate dealings with the socialist and non-socialist press alike. If this interpretation is correct, it would in turn imply that the faction's misgivings to the extent that they hinged on Lucis's past as an anti-Semitic activist at all, hinged on the anti-socialist activities that he had been part and parcel of his anti-Semitic activism, and in no way specifically on his anti-Jewish stance. Uh -huh. Even if this interpretation is not correct, and Babel and his colleagues did indeed assume that Lucis's reputation was compromised by his anti-Semitic past, their strong focus on the contempt with which Luce had previously treated social democracy would still be noteworthy. The, fax, the faction had made its decision con, contemptibly towards the party. Ah, uh, no. The faction had made its decision because Luce was not only badly compromised, but he had also behaved contemptibly towards the party. That his reputation was compromised alone would not have sufficed. The case against him only held when both issues were seen in conjunction. This surely implies that it was ultimately his previous behavior towards the party that tipped the scales against him rather than his anti-Semitic activism as such, as such, should that have been what the faction thought had compromised him. Another extremely interesting point that emerges from Babel's account is this. Those who made Luce's situation an issue at this point did so not because they themselves had registered Luce's forays into the party and felt the need to address his political or personal past for whatever reason. 
Instead, he did so because a local non-socialist paper had reported on the matter. This seems rather odd, for the reporting question was in fact barely four lines long, and simply related in a perfectly matter-of-fact way that the former anti-Semitic deputy Lewis sought to enter the social democratic fold through Franz Mehring's meditation and succeeded. Oh, mediation, and had succeeded because of Mehring. It added that the most recent issue of the Neuer Zeit had already brought an essay from him. Now, the edition of the Naya Zeit in question was by then at least a week old, and Lewis's poems, along with Mehring's detailed and friendly preface, had been published almost exactly three months earlier. Neither of these publications seemed to have precipitated any protests within the party. Not Lucis's publications in the Naya Zeit as such, then, were apparently the problem. It was the rather ambiguously formulated suggestion that he had entered the social democratic fold, in other words, that he had become a member. This raised the additional question of just how Mehring and Nyazait might have gone about bringing Lucis's into the fold of the party. In formal terms, the acceptance of the new members clearly lay beyond their competence and remit. But all that it may, as Babel explained to Kautsky in a distinctly distanced, distant, distanced manner, quote, the final result was that I am supposed to inform you and Mehring in the name of the faction, unquote, of its request that Lysis' role as a contributor be discontinued. There is certainly nothing to suggest that the initiative against Luce at this point may have hinged on Mehring's support for him, let alone that it might have been intended as a covert assault on Mehring. Mehring, as so often would seem to have contemplated such a connection nonetheless, Kautsky apparently informed Babel that Mehring had been his usual sus suspicious self. In response, Babel wrote to Kautsky on the 29th of November that Mehring, quote, was involved in the affair solely because the comment of the head of Courier mentioned his name as the one who brought Luce into the Nyazid. Without this remark, no one would have thought of him. He's utterly mistaken if he thinks that he had been implicated in some other way. At the time, then, Mehring's peers obviously by no means automatically drew a connection between him and Luce, let alone did they hold him solely responsible for Luce's involvement with the party and its publications. On the same day, 29th of November, Wilhelm Lichtnick, as the editor-in-chief of the Vorwitz, wrote to Luce, the fact that the Moscow archivist inventorized this letter as addressed to one G. Liss is a good indication of just how little attention Luce's case has received in the past. His attempts to employ him for the Vorwitz had met with resistance. Lichtnick informed Luce. Accusations have been leveled the validity of which I am currently examining, and which have nothing to do with your trial. Again, the same picture emerges. Even himself clarifies that Lucy's conviction was not the issue, and how indeed could it possibly have been the object of an accusations whose veracity needed to be established. The same holds true of Lucy's anti-Semitic and anti-socialist anti activism in the past. It would seem then that Liefnick had not yet become privy privy to the information confirming those apparently novel misgivings against Luce that Babel had received from Wachter and passed on to Kautsky. He would be in touch again soon, Lichnik continued, adding that he sincerely hoped that Luce would succeed in carving out an independent position for himself. Luce noted on top of the letter that he had received it on the 30th of November, and then sent it on to Mehring, writing to him on the back of Lichnik's letter and asking for his advice. Presumably, Mehring subsequently went to discuss the matter with Liefnick, with Lucas's letter in hand, which would explain how it found its way back among Liefnick's papers. Kautsky had no intention of simply giving in. Babel, in turn, remained far from convinced of the need to do so. He, partly, he apparently suggested to Kautsky that the matter might as yet be smoothed over if the Nyazite confirmed clarified its position. Hence, Kautsky issued a statement in Nyazite. In the name of the entire editorial team, it confirmed that the recent publication of an article by Hans Luce in Nyazite had, quote, variously led to the assumption that the author was thus being recognized by the editors as a member of the Social Democratic Party. This assumption is erroneous. 
we have neither the right nor do we feel the calling to determine the party membership of our contributors. Moreover, we have never found it incompatible with the tasks of our journal to open our pages to contributors who obviously do not belong to our party if their contributions seemed useful to our cause or had no prospect of being published in the bourgeois press. Lice had offered the Niazite a series of articles in which he wanted to portray his experiences with the prison system. Nobody will doubt that the subject is of utmost importance to us and that Luce is in a position to offer us substantial observations on the matter. He had proposed a series of articles to Niazite based on the pertinent assumption that he would be able to speak his mind more freely in our journal than in the bourgeois press. Against this background, all the inferences regarding Lysis's relationship with the party that he, had, that he had been drawn from the publication of the one introductory article published so far will hopefully obsolete. Okay. Let's take a break here. And pause. Okay, let's continue on with the reading of uh, Lars Fischer's uh, study, The Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State. On the 6th of December, 1899, Babel promptly informed the Faction of a statement by the editors of Nyazite arguing that contributors to Nyazite did not imply party membership. The Faction, however, was not appeased and expressed the wish quote, the wish the editors of Nyazai should in future reject contributions from Luce and also refrain from publishing the already accepted pieces. Babel himself still did not care much either way. If you do intend to publish the subsequent articles, he suggested to Kautsky, the easiest thing to do would be to present them under a pseudonym and a different title. That way both sides receive their due. Babel's report, Kautsky now retorted, greatly surprised me. Mehring and I had agreed with Meister and Wurm that we issue our statements that clearly testify to the fact that Lucius's collaboration is of an entirely apolitical nature, so that his articles on the prison system, which I committed myself to accept, could no longer be used against us. He had never intended to continue the collaboration with Seuss, loose beyond that anyway, so he says. Personally, he felt quite indifferent towards loose, but he would not renege on a commitment he had already entered into unless it was absolutely necessary. Oof. Hence, he felt deeply embarrassed by the demand of the faction. As we saw in the event, the Nyazite did in fact publish two further installments of Lucis's report on the prison system in March 1900. The deliberations of the Faction on Lucis's case at the end of 1899 would seem to present us with the same findings then as the confrontation unleashed at the Party Congress in Dresden in 1903. The one issue that we would be inclined to think of as crucial one did not feature in these deliberations either. Whether, and that is, whether or to what extent Lucis's perceptions and prescriptions regarding, quote unquote, the Jews, had chains simply did not strike any of the participants in these deliberations as relevant. Hmm. This is borne out yet further if we consider the following. The correspondence between Babel and Kautsky was edited by Kautsky's second son, Carl, 1892 to 1978. He himself stated in his introduction to the correspondence that, quote, as the last surviving member of Kautsky's immediate family, I was, although no professional historian, even so capable of illuminating otherwise dubious connections contributing to the characterization of many a half-forgotten personality. He had been all the more capable of doing so since he had, quote, grown up in the atmosphere, unquote, of the editorial dealings of the Nyazite. This claim is obviously credible, primarily for the last decade or so of Kautsky's career as the journal's editor-in-chief. His son was certainly too young to be able to remember the discussions of Lucis's case at the turn of the century. 
It is nevertheless noteworthy how Karl Kautsky Jr. Anointed, annotated Lucis's case. All he had to say on the matter was that Lucis had been in prison for perjury because he did not want to compromise a woman. Now, we may not know exactly how Karl Kautsky Jr. came to select this as the one piece of relevant information on Luce. Yet the main sources he drew on for this, for his annotation in general, are obviously enough. They were, firstly, his personal recollections, secondly, the recollections of surviving associates of his father who were willing to help him, and thirdly, the sources in secondary literature that are, in any case, in the public domain. Drawing on one or more of these sources, it was Lucius's conviction for perjury that struck him as the single most important piece of information worth passing on to the readers of his father's correspondence with Babel. This is even more remarkable if we take into account that he, in fact, added a reference to Mehring's Mein Reichfertigung, hmm, period. As Karl Kautsky Jr. pointed out, it contained a whole section on Luce. Yet in that section, Mehring quoted from the critique Fischer leveled at him in Dresden, including Fischer's explicit reference to Luce as a former anti-Semitic deputy. Assuming Karl Kautsky Jr. ever had a look at the section on Luce in my Rechtfertigung autobiography, the reference to Luce's anti-Semitic past must have failed to strike him as being of any particular importance. Alternatively, he may have included the reference to my Rechtfertigung unseen. Either way, the fact remains that none of the three types of sources at his disposal, suggested to Karl Kalski Jr. that anti-Semitism had played a role in this dispute. This would surely be inconceivable had Luce ultimately been rejected by the party because he was considered a closet, a closet anti-Semite and had Mehring stood more or less alone in supporting Luce's against the party's philo-Semitic onslaught. On a similar note, Mathe et Picard in their annotation of the minutes of the Reichstag Fraktion, simply explained that Hans Luce was a contributor to Nazi writing on criminal law and the penal system. They then refer the reader to page 86 of Frederick Stumpfer's memoirs for further information. There, Stumpfer, who is himself of Jewish extraction, discussed Luce in connection with the development of a number of former anti-Semitic activists. In this context, he introduced an interesting contrast. On the one hand, he discussed Wilhelm Kain, 1861-1944, who was notorious for this anti-Jewish animosity, even after he had become a social democrat. In a formulation that hence tells us rather a lot about the reliability of his judgments on the matter, Stumpfer claimed that Hein had, quote, not only become a social democrat, but also a veritable philo-Semite in contrast, unquote. He added, quote, to some Jewish social democrats who acknowledge a certain relative justification of anti-Semitism, unquote. Similarly to Hein, Stumpfer then went on. Hans Luce and Helmut von Gerlach had initially been anti-Semites. Then, however, they became editors of the radical Welt im Montag and had almost exclusively Jewish friends. Unquote. In a truly remarkable turn, Stumpfer then concluded his discussion by stating that, quote, Hein, Gerlach, and Luce are in part responsible for the fact that I initially misjudged the National Socialists. Hmm. They were such great guys, yet they had begun as reactionaries and anti-Semites. Should one take it to heart then, if there was always some new ferment that behaved absurdly? Given the abundance of inaccuracies in Stumpfer's memoirs, excuse me, it is difficult to determine which period exactly Stumpfer was referring to. Luce only became, only became an editor of the Welt in Montag in 1909. On the other hand, the fact that he had already been writing for the paper before 1903 must have been relatively well known, given that he was imprisoned at the time for an article published in that paper. Whether Stumpfer no longer recalled the conflict, 
in which Lucius's initial attempt to gain a foothold in the party had been embroiled, or simply decided not to mention it, is impossible to decide. Clearly, Stamford not only considered Luce a wholly reformed character, though, but felt the urge to say so in no uncertain terms. It, it therefore seems rather unlikely that Stamford would have forgotten all about this conflict or refrained from mentioning it, had Luce really been rejected by the party because the majority of his peers had been adamant that Luce was still an anti-Semite at heart. To add one more stone to our mosaic, let us turn to the colleagues who edited the relevant first volume of Rosa Luxemburg's collected letters under the auspices of Annalies Laschitza and Günther Ratzkums. Ratz, Ratzum. Okay. They explained that the, quote, the bourgeois author Hans Luce had been in prison for perjury and had not been able to secure livelihood on his release, unquote. Hence, he had turned to marrying. Later, he had written, quote, under very restrictive conditions for social democratic papers. In this context, quote, dishonesties transpired, aided by opportunists within one of the papers, unquote. Luce's anti-Semitism, past or present, finds no mention here either, let alone does it feature as an issue relevant to the conflicts he became embroiled in at the time. It would seem a rather massive coincidence should all the editors and authors just quoted simply have overlooked or disregarded the fact that the controversy surrounding Lucius's collaboration with the party press actually hinged on the fact that most social democrats found his position vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish question problematic. S does the second round of deliberations on Lucius's case in the Fraction a year later offer us anything that might change this picture? Rather remarkably, the report on the debate about Luce on the 12th of December 1900 is by far the most detailed account of any debate within the faction that could be found in the minutes up to that date. It discloses that the matter was discussed for no less than three hours, yet the information provided remains cryptic. The Frax Fraction ultimately moved the following motion. The Fraction expressed its opinion that it is not in the interest of the party that Luce work under the name, under his name in a literary capacity for the party, or that he holds some other responsible post, or be employed as a regular contributor. Unquote. As for the reasons, we are once again left none the wiser. Clearly, then, the only the one issue that would be inclined to think of as the most important one in all this, namely the extent to which Luce's attitudes regarding the Jews may or may not have changed, really did fail to feature in this dispute. To be sure, the fact that Luce had been an anti-Semite was, was mentioned, but the term anti-Semitism was used to denote no more than his former party political affiliation. The dispute would have been no different had Luce previously belonged to some other party that was not self-avowedly anti-Semitic. That it might take more than a change of party political affiliation to shed one Antisemitism is a notion to which not only Luce himself, but everyone involved in this dispute was entirely oblivious. What makes all this more disquieting is the fact that Luce's position vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish question, in fact, remained highly problematic. Really. Okay. So we'll leave it at that. We've gotten up to page uh, 135 here. And we will live it at such. And here again, oh yes, twenty-six to, what is it, one thirty-eight? Okay. And here I'll leave you with the Shabbos candles. And. Uh, Wishing to return to Palestine, I am thinking of Nablus, thinking of all the friends, colleagues, and comrades there who are now subject to most daily nightly incursions in Sector A, no less, of the IDF, which stands for Israel Death Force. Because that's what it does, and nothing else. So no use to the security of the Jewish people. It's a hindrance, it's an obstruction. It is the opposite.
of the security of the Jewish people. Thanking you for your attention this week and see you again next week.